welcome to this TaxCast Extra from the Tax Justice Network. I'm Naomi Fowler and I'm speaking with the Tax Justice Network's John Christensen. In this podcast, we discuss France's new anti-corruption law with new whistleblower protection. OK, John, France have passed recently, very recently, a new anti-corruption law that includes new protection for whistleblowers. Uh, this law is not without its problems, um, but um, it might well have provided protection for a whistleblower like Antoine Deltour and Raphael Ali, um, who exposed a scandal of so-called Lux leaks uh, a while back, which showed us the sheer amount of secret tax deals that were being made between Luxembourg, very often mediated by the accounting firm PricewaterhouseCoopers and multinational companies. So clearly they were acting in the public interest. Uh, and this French law is quite an encouraging development, uh, whilst at the same time we've got the European Union itself kind of dragging its feet over this. Yeah, this is an encouraging development. It's an important uh, step forward bearing in mind that France has found itself, for one reason or another, at the heart of many, many of the big whistleblowing stories. It isn't just, of course, the LuxLeaks, which involved French nationals working in Luxembourg who provided information to a French journalist. You also have HSP Geneva, where the information was provided to the French tax authorities, the so-called Lagarde lists were then, were then circulated elsewhere. That was um, Harvey Falciani. That then, um, you know, and, and and many of the stories, of course, are in, involve multinational banks as well as accounting firms um, with, with a French angle. So it's, it's, it's welcome that the French government, headed by Michel um, Sapin, it's called the Sapin Law, named after the minister who's put it through the uh, National Assembly, um, is welcome, very welcome that they're doing this. Um, because let's be honest, without whistleblowers, none of the big stories that have really pushed tax justice to the centre of the global agenda have, would, have, would have come out without whistleblowers. It's been the whistleblowers and the journalists who worked with those whistleblowers as, long, as well as civil society organisations that have forced politicians to take this seriously. Otherwise, they simply wouldn't have. They'd have continued to turn a blind eye. So whistleblowing is important, but we must understand the risks, the really grave risks that whistleblowers ha have run. It isn't just the loss of job, it isn't just the loss of status, the loss of income and the threats that are imposed upon them. It's the legal actions that some of them have to face, including um, really serious legal actions involving custodial sentences in the case of um, Del Tor and Raphael Hellet. It's the social ostracism living in a small community like Luxembourg when, where everyone will be scared about talking to you. Whistleblowing is a really serious uh, undertaking and governments have not been sufficiently serious about protecting whistleblowers even when there's a clear public interest in the stories that they're revealing. Now, the concern about the French law is that it won't be sufficiently broad in its scope. As originally drafted, it was tended to focus on health care issues and on environmental issues and on public service protections rather than looking at crimes that happen in the private sector. Well, we all know that an awful lot of crimes, fraud, embezzlement, tax evasion and so on, happen within the, the private sector. We'll have to see how this law beds down in terms of how the courts react to it and what, how far they're, they're prepared to extend the scope of the law to protect whistleblowers from all sectors. But this is a promising start. We certainly want to see other countries, like the United Kingdom, for example, which has a very old whistleblower protection in, in place. They, they need to catch up with, uh, with France, and ideally the European Union would come forward with the gold standard. Right, and in terms of the European Union, uh, I said it's dragging its feet over this. We're seeing the, uh, an appeal against the LuxLeaks uh, whistleblowers. They're going back into court once again in Luxembourg because the Luxembourg prosecutor's not uh, happy with the sentence. Um, neither of the whistleblowers, but for different reasons. So what we have at the moment is a new initiative that's been set up by the Greens and the Europe Free Alliance in the European Parliament called EU Leaks, which is a European platform or kind of portal for whistleblowers where they can submit information in an anonymous way without leaving a sort of a, an electronic trail, which again, shame that uh, initiatives like this are necessary because 
you know, in the absence of proper EU lawmaking. And on the other hand as well, the uh, United Nations has come out recently with a report recommending strong whistleblower protection. That's the fifth report of the independent expert on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order asking to enact legislation to protect whistleblowers and witnesses and ensure that individuals who want to share information about corporate tax practices which harm human rights are not prosecuted or subjected to reprisals. And they also call for an authorised channel for those kind of disclosures as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think having an authorised channel is absolutely key to this because... Whistleblowers need to be confident that they are dealing with the right authorities. I think we need to move also beyond the passive protection one to an active protection model where we recognise that a whistleblower operating within a bank who reveals that that bank is engaged in criminal activity. I'm thinking here of people like Rudy Elmer and Herve Falciani. They aren't just protected by law, so they are, they can't have retaliatory measures brought by their former employers, but that they're also supported because, as I say, they, they lose their careers, they lose their financial security, they, they run the risk of ostracism, they might well need active help with re-establishing new careers in different countries. So it's not just a case of being passively supported. I think we now need to recognise that whistleblowing takes a huge amount of courage. It's a massive public service and we need to invest in it. I'm not necessarily proposing that we follow the American example where the Internal Revenue Service, for example, will hand as much as 10% of the final take, whatever whatever they capture as a result of a, a, a leak or a whistleblowing exercise, will, will go to the, to the whistleblower. Yeah, I'm not, not necessarily suggesting idea. that. It certainly <laughs> provides a strong financial incentive, but then raises questions about the integrity of the whistleblower herself. And many whistleblowers are doing this primarily for public service. That's what drives them. And they want recognition for that. They don't want to be told, you're just doing it for money. But I do think we have to recognise they will need support to get back onto the, to a different career, maybe. This is a real tax justice front line, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is core to the Tax Justice Network. I'm proud of the fact that we've helped many whistleblowers. We will continue to do that. But we think that the best way of helping whistleblowers is to put into place the right kind of institutional measures and protections and support so that people won't spend all their time looking over their shoulder wondering when they're going to be, you know, at worst, attacked physically and how they're going to survive with their families going forward. You've been listening to a TaxCast Extra. To hear our monthly TaxCasts, go to www.taxjustice.net forward slash TaxCast or find us on iTunes or on www.youtube.com forward slash Tackle Tax Havens.